There was, a, there was a guy named Carl. There was a guy named Carl who grew up in a small town. And see, Carl was raised in a Christian home. And he was taught the things about the Bible. He was taught things about Jesus. He, he was taught things about the church. And, and in fact, on one Sunday, he was, he was sitting in a church service very much like this. He was sitting in a church service, and he was feeling moved by the message of the gospel. And, and he, he hung around after everyone left, after the crowd cleared, and he, he talked to the pastor. He said, hey, pastor, I, I want to I talk to you for a second. He said, he said, I would like to buy about $3 worth of the gospel. And the pastor looked puzzled at him, as you could imagine. And, and Carl, but he continued to listen to, to Carl. He said, he said now, here, here's the thing. I don't want too much. He goes, hey, I don't want too much. I want just enough to make me happy, but not enough to where I get addicted. He said, I don't want so much that I start loving my enemies, that I start reading or spending time reading my Bible or, or contemplate living on mission. He said, I want happiness, but not holiness. He said, I want transcendence, but not transformation. He said, Pastor, I want, I want forgiveness without repentance. And, and, and I would like about $3 worth of the gospel, please. You see, the pastor looked at Carl kind of in disbelief about his just brutal honesty of what he felt and his frankness. And the thing is, of course, none of us were probably honest enough to put it all out there like Carl. But sometimes I think that we're faced with this, day, this temptation on a daily basis where we want about $3 worth of the gospel. We want the benefits of the gospel without the, the effects that inevitably come and that produce in our life. You see, is it even the gospel? Is it even possible, though, is my question this morning. Is it even possible? Can, can you have just some of the gospel, or is it an all or nothing thing? And so, spoiler alert, here's the bottom line for this morning. Is that we're gonna put, we want to put the gospel first. We want to put the gospel first. That's our bottom line. We're going to say it a whole lot. But that's the idea for today that we want to say is how we're going to put the gospel first in, in our life. But how do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about this this morning. In fact, we're going to be in the book of Philippians. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. But we're not going to be there just quite yet. You see, Paul writes his letter to the church at Philippi. In fact, our their team that went to Greece, they actually spent time in the ruins of Philippi. I got to spend some time there after I graduated college. I spent seven weeks in Thessaloniki, Greece doing mission work, and we got to tag along and go to Philippi and see the ruins that are there still to this day. But before we get to Philippians, I want to talk a little bit about how the church at Philippi was started, because I think it's very important for us to know the context of who Paul is writing to. You see, in Acts chapter 16, the first five verses, Paul creates this team of himself Silas and, and Timothy. And these are his co-laborers. These, these are his bros. These are his guys that he's going to battle with when it comes to sharing the gospel. And what I love about Timothy is he was that young gun. He, you know, that young gun that's just excited about everything. That, that was Timothy. And what's interesting is where they decided to go. Let's read. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 6, or 16, verse 6. And this is what it says. And forgive me if I butcher a lot of these region names. Okay. And he went through the region of of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Messiah, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Messiah, they went to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that, that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace in the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we remained there some days. You see, we don't know why God chose Macedonia, but more specific, or more specifically Philippi, but we do know that that is where he wanted Paul, Timothy, and Silas to go. It's very clear. He said, hey, we want you to preach in Philippi. In fact, they were forbidden to go to Asia. The door was shut. It wasn't by men, it was by the Holy Spirit. 
Have you ever been in that situation before where where you feel like God has just closed the door in your life and you can look back on it now and you're like, man, God closed that door. But in that moment, you were confused. You were maybe frustrated. You were maybe unsure about what was going on. Maybe he closed a friendship. Maybe he closed a relationship. Maybe he moved you across the country. We don't really know, but but we know here that that door was closed to Asia and he sent to to Philippi. And so we see here that they, they, they immediately sought to go. And that they took a direct voyage to Philippi. You see, the Philippian church was planted out of the direct obedience of Paul, Timothy, and Silas. It was their direct obedience that God had commanded. But what's important about this church planting team that that Paul, Timothy, and Silas encounter is the the first three people we're going to see in this story. And the first one's this. Her name's Lydia. Let's read about her. He says, that on the Sabbath day we went outside to the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who had heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is a, an actual picture that I took, hence the grainy photo. I, went, I was in 2010 was when I went to, to visit Greece. This is uh, the, where they say that this conversation took place. If you've ever gone on the Israel trip last summer, or I, I guess you're not on the Greece trip right now because you're here and not there. But I, I would encourage you, man, go, to, go on these trips if you ever have an opportunity. Because scripture comes to life when you can stand in those places and read these stories and say, man, it's a, it's a really good chance that this is exactly where this conversation happened. Man, it was, it's so cool. See, for Lydia was a God-fearing, very wealthy, had her own career in a day and age that that was not very common. You see, we know she was wealthy because she was a seller of purple goods, that she lived in uh, Thyteria, right? Like the, 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 that she, but she also had a home in Philippi. So she had more than one residence. The home in Philippi wasn't small because she invites them over, right? It clearly could house at least four guests. So we know this lady is a very wealthy woman, and she's been radically transformed by the gospel in her whole household as well. We, we read that in Acts. But the thing is, God didn't choose her, didn't choose to reveal himself to her because of what she had or what she knew. He chose to reveal himself to her because for his glory and his renown. You see, Lydia was a part of a much higher social class. Like probably somebody, if we were putting a church planting team together right now, we'd probably say, we need somebody who can help us pay the bills, right? That's probably somebody we would probably throw immediately. But the next person in our story, I don't know if we would necessarily add them to our church planting team in our modern day language. It was a slave girl. Look what we continue to read. It says, and as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Interestingly enough, the, the demon girl is the one preaching the gospel right now, right? And it's what she said. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. This is a picture of uh, some of the ruins of the city of Philippi. Now, I don't know where this conversation happened, but I, I just have, I had this picture. I discovered Facebook's a great place just to log pictures. I found all of these on my Facebook account from back in 2010. But here's the thing. Paul is so frustrated with this little slave girl that's following her around. Like, literally, Paul is, it says he's annoyed here. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, have to, I read things in the, in the English Bible, and I'm like, well, did that word even exist back in, like, New Testament? Annoyed? Like, we get annoyed all the time, right? But I I looked it up, and it's a real word. It it was used, and it means greatly disturbed or irked. You ever been irked before? Like, you know know that feeling? Like, irked, I think, describes it just in a different way. Like, you've been irked. If you don't know irked, then you probably aren't old enough, right? But irked, right? We've all been irked. But it's interesting to know that this is the only place that we see in all the New Testament that this Greek word for irked is used. That's how bothered Paul was by this this demon-possessed slave girl. It's the only place we see it used. And so Paul, he gets so annoying with her that she's following him around that he just rebukes the demon right out of her. I mean, he gets so annoyed, he's like, boom, it's just done. 
Like, you got to get pretty annoyed to be just throwing demons out of people, right? Like, I spent a lot of time in middle school ministry. I'm like, man, maybe I just missed a calling there. Like, I mean, like, this, this happens. I was like, I missed something. But here's the thing. Like, Paul's plan, though, that morning when he got up probably wasn't to start converting slave girls. Right? It, 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 but here's the thing. Here's what's so cool about this interaction. We have to remember that God can use us even in our annoyance. Man, he was... He did it out of frustration. You know, I don't know if he did it out of spite, but he was so irked that he was like, get, get out of this girl. And God used him even in that annoyance. And so we've got a, we've got a wealthy woman named Lydia. We've got a, 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 freely, a, a demon-possessed freed slave girl now. And, and now we have, we have the jailer. Now, I'm not going to read all the verses because we don't have time to read all of the next 30 verses or 25, 21 verses in the, in the passage. But let me just summarize it for you. We see this jailer. See, Paul rebukes the demon. And when he does that, the people who owned this slave girl were very mad because they used her and her demonic powers to, uh, to tell fortunes, to get, have much gain. And so they go to the magistrates and they tell them, hey, you got to do something about these Jews. They're making people crazy. Like, you got to do something about it. You got to get them out of here. You've just got to do something. And so the magistrates, they, 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 they beat them, they tear their clothes, and then they throw them in jail. And they order the jailer to keep them safe. And so what does the jailer do? He, he tortures them. <laughs> He puts them in, in shackles and then he stocks. They're not stocks like we see in the medieval like festivals. These are stocks that like contorted the body around just to keep them in this, this state of great pain. But Paul, Timothy, and Silas respond to this, this torture by, by singing praises to God and by praying. And the thing was, while the jailer was asleep, a great earthquake came and all the doors were opened to the jail and the jailer wakes up and he just assumes that all the prisoners have, have left and they've run away and now they're free. And so he begins to prepare himself to commit suicide because he knew the magistrates would, not, would, not, would put him to death anyways. And so he was going to do that. And right as he was about to fall on his sword, Paul yells, he says, we're still here. He says, we're still here. And so the jailer grabs a light and he goes to them and he asks them how he can be saved. And so the jailer is saved just like Lydia, the rich girl, and just like the demon-possessed slave girl. You see, all three were saved by the same God through very different means out of very different circumstances. Isn't that the beauty of the God that we serve? If you're a follower of Jesus, we've all been saved by the same God out of very different means and, and out of very different circumstances. And this is the foundation of the church of Philippi. Probably not going to go on at some church conference and church planning and say, hey, let's find a, a, a suicidal jailer, a slave girl, and a, and a rich woman to plant a church today. That's not really the, the methods in, that they're teaching at seminary typically, but that's what we see here in, in, in Philippi. These are the founding members of Paul's missionary journey. You see, Lydia would normally not be hanging out with a slave girl. She wouldn't be hanging out with a, with a suicidal jailer, but she is now. A slave girl wouldn't even be allowed or welcome to socialize with either of them, but she is now. You see, all of them are welcome and equal because of the sacrifice of Christ, because of the gospel. And Christians, man, let me just ask you this. Who are you not associating with or not loving well because you're feeling, you, you have a feeling that they're just not worthy of your time? Who do we encounter on a daily basis that we see in a different light that, man, God can save them too? See, here's why it's important. You see, we are not welcomed in the church by who we are, but we are by, but by whose we are. We're not welcomed in the church by who we are, but by whose we are. We have been purchased by the blood of Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have placed your faith in Christ, you have been purchased by the blood and we can have community together. And that's the beauty of the church. Again, this is what they rested in. These three people who had nothing in common except for the gospel. They became close. And, and it may, maybe we be a church that welcomes everyone, every race, every economic status, every different, every person in an attempt to just have an opportunity to experience the beauty, mercy, and grace of Jesus. Man, so we've got this church at Philippi. It, it was started with, it was started with a, with a wealthy, a God-fearing wealthy woman named Lydia, a slave girl delivered from a demon, and, and a suicidal jailer. That's what the foundation of this church no one is too far from the grace of God. No one. So maybe you're sitting here this morning and be like, you just don't know my story. I don't know your story, but it may not be as bad as one of these. No one is too far from the grace 
of God. And so we see this. This is who Paul is writing to. And so let's jump into our text in in Philippians chapter 1 this morning. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for all you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now i am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of jesus christ it is right for me to feel this way about you all because i hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me in grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel For God is my witness how I yearn for you all in the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that that your love may abound more and more with the knowledge and all discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and to the praise of God. Man, why don't we write letters to each other anymore, especially like this? I mean, just what a poetic way to write. And this, this is how he starts. He reads it. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Servants of Christ Jesus. It means to be, it, it's this Greek word, doulos. It means to be a slave, to be a bond servant, to be an indentured servant. Meaning this, that it was pertaining to a state of being completely controlled by someone or somebody. And this is how they introduce themselves. Hey, we are completely and utterly controlled by Jesus Christ. We are under absolute domination of Christ Jesus. Man, what a way to describe yourself. They're saying, hey, we yield to everything that he is saying, and this is, who, this is the authority in which we write this letter. And it says they write it to all the saints, meaning that this is a letter written to Christ followers. It's an important context to know when you see this. That these aren't just this like wordy or, or beautiful introductions that help us understand who these letters were originally written to. And in the first section we see of, of verses 3 through 8, Paul's greeting this church at Philippi. He's greeting them. And we already talked about the founding members, and so you can understand how like, unlikely of a motley crew this church probably is. Right, for them to interact with one another. And and Paul wants to point to them why he is thankful for them. He said, man, I'm so thankful. In verse 3, he says he thanks God and his memories of them. He he says that that he has prayers of joy for them. I mean, the church of Philippi for Paul was a source of joy. It was a source of joy for him. But what made it a source for joy for him? Look what it says in in verse 5. It says, because for your partnership in the gospel... From the first day until now. It was their partnership in the gospel. Nothing bonds believers than sharing the gospel together. I don't know if you've ever been on like a mission trip or served with anyone in, in, in a ministry or you've gone anywhere in our community. Maybe you served with your connect group. There's, there's just something that bonds you together when you lock arms together and, and share the gospel. Man, it's an incredible thing and that's why he's thankful for them. And that's the first thing I want you to see this morning is that we must be partners in gospel work. I don't know if you realize this or not, but we're all on the same team. That doesn't just mean in this room. That means with the other churches in our city. We must be partners in gospel work. We are all on the same team. And what I love that he uses that word partnership, it's also the same Greek word that's translated as fellowship. If you've grown up in a Southern Baptist church or any church, really, I, I grew up in, my, my dad was a pastor when I was growing up, and I've, I pretty much, I feel like I was born on the first front pew where I took lots of naps while he preached. Like, I mean, like, I grew up in the church, and we always threw around the word fellowship, but I never really knew what it meant, because I think we throw it around so much that it's lost its original meaning. You see, this idea of fellowship is, is different than we sometimes associate it. Like, if I invite an unbeliever, if me and my wife, Rebecca, we invite an unbeliever over to our house for dinner, we're, we're, uh, we're engaging in friendship. We're enjoying friendship. But if I invite a believer over, then, then we're enjoying fellowship. Now, this may not be a fair definition, but, but the heart of fellowship is this, this self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. It's a self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. Like I said, that word fellowship is translated as partnership here. 
And, and sometimes it's that way because there's usually some sort of monetary element that is involved in the relationship. But the thing is, is this, is that fellowship doesn't exist without losing selfishness and pursuing the shared vision of the gospel. Man, it's, it's so different than sometimes we experience. See, notice Paul doesn't thank God for the times that they shared eating together. He said, man, we had some good meals. Man, that banana pudding that y'all, <laughs> we had last week, which I love banana pudding, by the way, so that's all I think about. He didn't say that. He didn't say, man, we really, he doesn't thank them for, for all the games that they played together. He, he, did, he, he, did, he doesn't thank them for, for the, the conversations they had about the game this last weekend. But rather, he is joyful and thankful for the partnership and the fellowship that they have in the gospel. In the gospel. Now, how does that play out in our everyday life? Though? Let's continue reading. He says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. I always want to say y'all there because I'm from Texas. So about y'all. Okay, but, but because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you in all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Man, Paul has confidence that the Philippians will not turn their back on him. He has confidence they're not going to turn their back on him. But again, why? Why does he have this confidence? Why does Paul have confidence in them? We just told us, it says that it is right for him to feel this way about them, that, that because they share in the gospel work together. They have shared in the gospel work. The gospel partnership that we have should give us joy and it should give us co uh, confidence. That's what we want to see. We must be confident in each other. We must be confident in each other. See, Paul starts this conversation with the Philippians talking about why or what they had in common, right? He starts talking about what we have in common. And for them, for them, the thing that bound them together was the gospel. Remember, you got to think about the motley crew that he put together. The only thing they really had in common was, was the gospel. But let's look at the conversations that we may have with each other. We talk about our friends. We, we talk about how our weekend went. We talk about football. We talk about food. We talk about our family. Sometimes maybe you talk about video games or TV shows that you've been watching recently. Who's dating who? You know, like the whole list goes on and on. But, but what might be missing from our list is, is the gospel. So what do we talk about when we're together? What, what ties us together as believers? What, what, what puts us together? You see, none of those topics are, are bad, but, but they're, 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 not, they're not forever. They're, they're not forever. What makes us different? What, what, if somebody comes in from the outside world who doesn't know Jesus, they should look at us and say, man, what makes our conversations different? And what makes them different is the gospel. What ties us together is the gospel. It gives us partnership and it gives us fellowship and in our conversation should be regularly about sharing the gospel uh, should be regularly about delighting in what the Lord is doing in our lives. But about, it should be about what we're learning in, in his word. We should be joining together in prayer for the advancement of the gospel. You see, true fellowship only happens when the gospel is put first. It only happens when the gospel is put first. That means we don't have time for all some of the, the petty things that sometimes happen in church life. We just don't have time for it. Eternities are at stake. Man, verse 6, it tells us that he who began a good work, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You know what that means? It means that we are all works in progress. We can all take a deep exhale. <sighs> take the pressure off. We are all a work in progress. We're not there yet. I mean, how much easier would it be if you knew your brothers and sisters in Christ were confident in you in your failings? Man, wouldn't it make following Jesus a little bit easier if we knew that the people that we spent, that we do life with, that they're not going to look at us any different when we do fail because we are all work in progress? That those people will speak truth into your life, that they will, they will expose your sin, but, but they will still have confidence because we are all partakers of the same grace? Man, what a different world community looks like when we can be confident in one another even in our failings. See, we must, we must put the gospel first, and that means that the gospel must be the center of our fellowship. It, the gospel must be the center of our, of our conversations. And in the last three verses, the text that gives us this content of Paul's prayer for the church. 
gives us this content. Paul thinks of, about the joy and the confidence that he has in their partnership. Let's look, look what, read it again. It says, And it is my prayer that for your love may abound more and more with the knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. So you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. You see, we must pray for each other. We must pray for each other. You're like, well, I do pray for my friend. We must pray for each other in the, in the advancement of the gospel. You see, the content of Paul's prayer is that they, we, that, we would, that they would grow in their love for God and they would grow in their love for others. Man, how often are we praying for others, saying, man, God, help me to love the people in my life better. Help me to love you more. That's the content. Putting the gospel in your life first means that your prayers are gospel-centered and your conversations are gospel-focused. In verse 9, he talks about they would grow in their love for each other, their, their understanding of the gospel, that they would, that the 10, that they would become more in love with him, that they would be pure, and then the one day that they would, when they come face to face with Christ, that they would be pure and blameless. And then in 11, he tells us why it's all for the glory and the praise of God. That is why we do what we do, all for the glory and the praise of God. It wasn't to make much of Paul's church. It's not much, it's, it's not, we're not here to make much of, of one church. We're here to make much of the name of Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying. It's Christ's name that would be glorified through all and by the believers putting the gospel first. And so we've got to do this in our life. We can't fall into the temptation of wanting three dollars worth of the gospel because i think if we're honest with ourselves sometimes we would we would love to partake in happiness but not holiness we love to have transcendence but not transformation we would love to have just enough jesus that we're content or feel that fill, fill a small void but really we're just empty on the outside on the inside so how do we practically do this? I want, I want to give you some takeaways this morning on how we can practically do this, okay? The first one is this, is that we need to prior, prioritize intentional prayer. Man, if it, my college students and young adults can tell you that I use this word intentional a lot. I'm intentional about using the word intentional. Man, we have to be intentional in our walk of life. We've got to prioritize intentional prayer. Not just necessarily, I'm not saying any prayer, but prioritize intentional prayer. We've got to put the gospel first in our prayers, we need to pray that the gospel would advance here at our church. We need to pray that the gospel would advance through you and your friends in your workplace or in your schools. We need to pray that the gospel would advance in our city. And so I think you can do something really simple. You can begin to do this every single day. I want you, I want, you can pray three things. Now let me warn you, if you begin to pray these three things, just prepare God to work, okay? And the first one you can pray for is this, you can pray for burden. You can pray for a burden for the lost. Man, there are thousands of people in our city that are going to spend an eternity in a real place called hell, separated from God forever. We need to have a burden for the lost. We need to have a burden for those who don't know Jesus. We need to have a burden for those who, who aren't here yet. We need to have a burden for those who are hurting and who are helpless. So begin to pray, God, give me a burden for the lost today. Give me a burden for the people who are around me. Let me be able to see them. Let me be able to see the people around me who, who are the walking dead. They're spiritually dead. They're, they don't have true life because you haven't given it to them. Let me see them. Give me a burden. But a burden, it can't stop with just a burden. You've got to pray for an opportunity. God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel today. Man, when you begin to pray for an opportunity to share the gospel, just get ready. <laughs> God's going to present opportunities for you to share the gospel. And so when you begin to pray for that burden, it, it, it helps for you to uh, uh, grab onto those opportunities a little better because you hurt for them. You may weep over them. But when God begins to grant opportunities, I hope you pray for the third thing because you're going to need it, which is boldness. God, give me boldness to share when those opportunities occur. Because if you're like me, you, you know when the Holy Spirit has sometimes planted that opportunity right in front of you, but you just haven't been very bold to take that opportunity. 
The thing is, I think sometimes he, in the church, as a general, the general church, I think sometimes we can spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven than getting them into heaven. What, what, what do I mean by that? I think we can spend more of our time praying over sicknesses and illnesses than we can praying for those who don't know Jesus yet. We need to pray for people. We need, we need to pray for a burden for the lost, an opportunity to share the gospel, and the boldness to share when that opportunity comes. Because it's a real thing. And so I made it real easy for you. Every day I want you to pray for Bob, okay? It's real easy to remember. Every day just pray for Bob. Pray for a burden, pray for an opportunity, pray for boldness. Pray for Bob every single day as you prioritize intentional prayer, but also we want, we want to do this. The second takeaway is this. We want to initiate gospel conversations we want to initiate gospel conversations we need to put the gospel first in our conversations you know interest in, in attraction uh things in common with someone they, they can bind us for a short amount of time but the gospel joins us for all eternity man it, it's cool for me to think that believers that i knew 10 15 years ago that i've seen once or twice in the last decade that i get to spend eternity with i don't get to see them now but man we're gonna have a good time when we get to heaven and that's the difference, right? Like we can be bound by sports teams and allegiance, like, like some of y'all are Tennessee fans and we'll pray for you. Um, some of us are Alabama fans and I don't know, all the Tennessee fans are like, all right, I'm out. I didn't say that until now so you would stay engaged. You know, like I'm a Cowboys fan so like everybody that loves us or they hate us, like there's no in between. We can have those allegiance, but nothing bonds us like the gospel. Man, one of my favorite things about working with college students is that I've seen guys from all walks of life, country boys to city slickers to all that and everything in between, become best friends, groomsmen into each other's weddings because the only thing that originally bound them together was the gospel. They had nothing else in common. Where our privilege is heard, I had a student who was a homeschooled musician who loved to read and, and think all things intellectual, and I had a, a football player studying to be a coach from small town uh, uh, Louisiana. They would have no reasons to be friends. In the, in the regular world, they would never interact, they would never come together, they would never be friends. And I just went to a wedding where one of them was getting married and the other was his groomsman, and they're best of friends because of their bond in the gospel. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so that means we've got to have gospel conversations, we've got to put Jesus at the center, we've got to put the gospel first in, in our conversations, whether it's sharing the gospel or interacting with somebody else. Maybe you need to share the gospel with a person in your life who doesn't know Jesus, your family, a friend, maybe, maybe the server at lunch. I don't know what, what that world looks like, but when you begin to pray for Bob and we begin to initiate gospel conversations, it's really cool to see how the Lord works. We need to share the gospel with people no matter what walk of life that they come from or that they may currently be in. That's what Paul did. He shared the gospel with the rich girl, the slave girl, the suicidal jailer, right? Like, that's who it was. But I get it. Like, I, I, I really do get it. Like, what if they don't respond too well? What if they get mad? What if they get frustrated with me? What if, what if they get upset? I think it's all about our approach. You see, when you give a dog, uh, when a dog is chewing on a bone, when a dog is chewing on a bone, you don't just go up to the dog and try to pull that bone away from him, Right? Like, can you imagine, like, uh, if, if a Rottweiler, or we'll go Pitbull, they have a bad rap anyways. Pitbull, really I think Chihuahuas and uh, Dachshunds are more aggressive, but, but Pitbull, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't grab a bone from a Chihuahua. Let's go back to that one. So he said there's a Chihuahua up here, okay? Like, you're definitely not going to pull that bone away because it's going to bite you, right? You wouldn't take a bone away from a dog because you know you're going to end up getting bit. But instead what you do is, is you get you a nice New York strip, a nice... A uh, ribeye, maybe a, a little bitty filet mignon, whatever it is, you go, you go get you a nice steak and you cook it up and you bring it to that dog and you say, here you go. What's that dog going to do? They're going to take the steak and they're going to leave that bone behind and forget all about it. You see, the thing is, the gospel's the steak. So many times we try to rip the bone, pull the things away from people in their current lifestyle who don't know Jesus. We put, try to put them in a Christian box when they're not a Christian. But instead, if we'll offer them the gospel and they'll grab onto the gospel, then they'll forget all those things that were behind them. Man, we've got to do this. We've got to offer them the saving grace of Jesus. We've got, to, we've got to love the person. We've got to treat them like Jesus died for them. We've got to share the gospel with them and then allow Christ to do the saving. Because we're not trying to change their mind. We're trying to change their life. 
And so how can we initiate gospel conversations? Um, I mentioned a minute ago, like, if you don't know, I'm from Texas. I try to tell everybody that because I learned that Texans are pretty prideful when it comes to Texas. Now, I haven't lived in Texas the last seven years. So, like, one thing I do miss, I will say this. Tennessee, there's some great food here. But one thing there is not that I have not found, and if you own a local Mexican food restaurant, I am sorry, but one thing I have not found yet is a local Mexican food restaurant that I just love. I'm kind of a snob about it. I will judge a Mexican food restaurant in the first two minutes as they put chips and hot sauce in front of me, chips and salsa, okay? Um, if that's not good, I'm not coming back. <laughs> like, that's just how it is. I'm that, that's like my, the gold standard starts there. It's like, it's got to have good chips and salsa. And I'm also one of those people here. So if you ever have a meal with me at a Mexican food restaurant, just know this is going to happen. I'm giving you a warning now. I'm the person at the table who just go ahead and just salts the chips. I don't ask anybody. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to salt the whole basket. Like, you can, we can get another one, but like, I'm going to salt the basket of chips. That's what I'm going to do. In fact, I learned a hack a few years ago. I'm also going to salt my salsa. See, you get more salt in the salsa. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to do both. And so I, I, I love to put salt on those things. I just love chips and salsa. Me and my wife could eat just chips and salsa, like, for dinner. Like, that's what we do. But, but I love it. I'm always going to add some salt. And so this morning, I told you to pray for Bob, but here's what also what I wanted to do. For us to begin to initiate gospel conversations, I want us to add a little salt, okay? We're going to add a little salt. We're getting real Southern Baptist on the acronyms this morning, okay? Hey, here's the thing. What you got to do when it comes to initiating the gospel conversations, you just got to start the conversation. You're like, yeah, that's, thanks for being here this morning, Kendall. Yeah, start the conversation, right? It can be so simple. It can just be saying, hey, how are you? That can be so hard in our day and age today, right? Hey, how are you? Hey, hey, what's your name? Man, what do you do for a living? Like, where, where are you from? Are you from Murfreesboro? Did you grow up here? Like, that's an easy question to ask these days because there's so many people who aren't from Murfreesboro, right? You're like, where are you from? You just begin to start a conversation, it, it, it doesn't have to be overly difficult. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. Just starting a simple conversation. Why? Because you want to care for the person. Not because you want to share the gospel, although you're going to do that, but you want to start the conversation to care for the person. And here's the next easy question, or an easy thing to follow up, is you want to ask a question. Like, man, you're just solving all the world's problems. Ask a question, right? You can find out a whole lot about someone by asking simple questions. By asking simple questions. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're like, okay, you know, I've gotten this far. I, I, I know I'm pretty good at, where am I? there it is. I'm pretty good at asking a question. I'm pretty good at starting a conversation. I, I, I ask a little question about them. Um, I, I can do that. But I, I really struggle in transitioning to a spiritual conversation from whatever it is that we're currently talking about. Like, think about it this way. Has this ever happened to you? Like, maybe you're, maybe you're serving someone. Or you've just been kind to someone, or, or, or you're doing something, and they ask you this question. Have you ever been asked this question? Why are you doing this? It's like they lob a softball up there. <laughs> you're like, man, I'm so glad you asked why we are doing this. But a lot of times, I think our response ends like this. It says, oh, well, we're serving with our connect group from one church. Period. Or, 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 or I'm a Christian, and I go, I go to church on one church over to Jarnet. You, sh you should come check it out sometime. Period. We put a period at the end of that statement, right? And usually that's where the conversation ends. And you see the person who's usually asking those questions back, like they're just going to leave it there. That's, they walk away and, and you spend the rest of the day, the conversation just goes away. And they go on about their day. Or maybe you're even bold enough to say, hey, wait, do you, do you go to church anywhere? And being in the South, they're probably like, oh, yeah, I go to church, oh, so-and-so, then the name some church that's, that's in our city. And a lot of times we just leave it there, right? We're like, oh, cool, you go to church. All right, cool, we'll see you later. But what if, what if instead of just answering their question, you followed up your answer by adding a simple question to the end? See, Jesus loved to ask questions. He always asked people questions. Like, what if when they ask, why are you doing this, you respond, oh, I'm a follower of Christ. Do you have a faith? Five words. Do you have a faith? Those five words can drastically change your conversations. Those five words can take a normal conversation and turn it into a gospel conversation in a split second. It's not an overwhelming question. It's not an oppressive question. It's not one that you're throwing anything down the throat. You're just asking them, hey, do you have a faith? Let me put a little context to it. You're at the server. Maybe some of y'all do this. I know some of y'all do this at lunch. You're about to pray for the food, and so you'll ask the server, like, hey, is there anything we can pray for? Hey, can we pray for you? We're about to pray for the food. You got anything we can pray for? And the, the, most people don't turn down prayer, even if they're not a believer. 
Um, they'll ask that question. Or maybe you're at the baseball field and you're at your, your kid's game and, and the people who are around you just notice how you just treat your family different, how y'all interact different, how you hopefully don't yell at the umpires differently, how, you know, all those different things, how, how you conduct yourself a little differently. And they ask you that question like, like what's different about you? And your response can, can be something similar, like, well, I'm a follower of Christ. Do you have a faith? And then the important letter that sometimes we just gloss over is we've got to listen. We've got to listen. We have to listen. See, once that you can understand, when you listen, you can understand a little background and understand their why. You can ask follow-up questions and continue to understand where they're coming from. Because until you know where they're coming from, you can't really help push them in the direction that they need to go. Maybe they don't know Jesus at all. Maybe they've been hurt by the church. Maybe they just currently aren't going anywhere. Maybe they're really involved and they're really encouraged because you're, you're sharing the gospel with them. I don't know about you as a Christian, when somebody tries to share the gospel with me, I'm encouraged that there's believers sharing the gospel with people. But we've got to listen. How did they come to that conclusion? What does it mean for them to believe what they believe? You see, one of my favorite trips that, that we go on every single, the, the last couple years we've gone and uh, is, is on spring break, we've got a mission trip called Beach Reach. We, we partner with the BCM in that trip and, and, and actually a couple other local churches. And, and it's really cool that it'll be going with us this year. And, and, and we go on this trip and the opportunity of this trip is literally just an opportunity for, for us as leaders to train up college students and to just to see them share the gospel. We give van rides. If you've been around, we talk about it a good bit. We give van rides to college students who are spring breakers. And the way it's set up is like, for me, I get to drive the van and, and we keep the cab lights on for safety and everyone's strategically set up on a row and I get to watch students behind me just share the gospel. I get to kind of be that nosy, like listen in and just, I get to hear and watch and man, be encouraged and, and pray for them while they're sharing the gospel, pray for them while they're having spiritual conversations. But one conversation that will forever stick with me one conversation that will ever stick with me was one of our students from last year. We, we were talking about this idea what is, of asking that question, do you have a faith? And they asked that question and, and the student responded this. He says, oh yeah, I'm Catholic. And see, a lot of times we would hear that answer and we would just be like, all right, well, cool, have a good day. But he asked this question and, and I've always, I was like, man, I, I fell in love with just, let's learn how to ask better questions all the time because he asked this question and I heard him ask this. He says, what does it mean to you to be Catholic? such a simple question but had a, such a profound response as this student stopped in his tracks and began to ponder and he goes you know what I don't know and so he got the opportunity to, to share with him a little more but just the the downside to the van rides is we inevitably have to drop them off and they have to get out and they have to go home and but as he was getting out of the van I remember him saying to our student he says I, I don't know but I'm gonna go think about it he says I'm gonna think about it you see, a lot of times we focus so much on the talking and not enough on the listening and letting them reflect and, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work. And so once we listen, we've got to tell the story. We've got to tell the story of the gospel. But it may not start there. You see, it's most likely going to start with your story, your testimony, how Jesus has changed your life. You may have an opportunity to utilize a gospel tool like the three circles or one verse evangelism or the bridge or whatever it may be. Like if you have a method that you use, use it. But, but what I do know is your opportunity may be limited. And so learn to share your story in two to three minutes. And I think a quick spark note or cliff note option is, is something like this. Who you were before Christ, what Christ did, and who you are after Christ. If you can answer those questions and fill in your details, there's a short two to three minute story of who you are, your testament, how Jesus has changed your life. Because this is ultimately a response. You were dead in sin, Jesus paid the price, and now you're alive in Christ. That's the gospel. Like we were dead in sin, but because of the, the, the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross, he paid a debt that we could not pay, something that we could not do on our own. Because of that, we've placed our faith in him, we've made him the Lord of our life, and now we are alive in Christ to spend eternity in heaven with God. You can have that opportunity. Man, these are the conversations that can happen every day. They don't have to happen on a platform. And so you may be sitting here this morning and be like, man, I, I, Kim, if I'm honest, I've, I've never shared the gospel with anybody. Let me just be frank. I get it. I'm more intimidated to share the gospel one-on-one -on -one than I am to stand up here and talk to you guys. You're like, that's crazy. <laughs> but it's the truth. I get it. 
But we begin to pray for the burden and opportunity and boldness. We begin to initiate gospel conversation. It's really cool to see how God can work. And so that's your homework this week. I don't know if you noticed our ticker outside, but, but we're real close to 1,000 conversations. We might have gone over it this morning. 1,000 gospel conversations for this year. We're a little behind our goal, but man, if we can be behind our goal but still be making active gospel conversations, what an awesome opportunity. And so my challenge to you this week is to share the gospel with somebody. Initiate a gospel conversation. And you may be nervous already. You may be anxious already. Be like, what if I just don't say the right thing? Let me just say, that's okay. It's okay. If we're honest, it's kind of arrogant for us to think that God can't use us if we don't say this exact proper right words. Man, we serve a God who saves and he can use you. And so, man, prioritize intentional prayer and initiate gospel conversations. Do that this week. And don't forget my, my fun little acronyms. Pray for Bob every day. And add a little salt to your life. You won't regret it. Because following Jesus isn't boring when you're doing these things. Following Jesus is one of the most exciting things that you can do.